earlier with that breakthrough in negotiations for hostages taken by Hamas with a dramatic first image now coming into us of the mother and daughter released just moments ago. Here it is, our first look at those hostages who have been freed. Two Americans kidnapped now safely back in Israel. So is this just the beginning? What does it mean for the other roughly 200 hostages? And what about the Israeli ground attack? We're live in Tel Aviv with every angle. Plus, in Lebanon, a new warning to Hezbollah from Israel, basically saying, don't try us. What our reporter on the ground there is seeing as fighting on the border between those two countries intensifies. Then, new drama upending the old drama drama at the Capitol, which as we speak remains speakerless. The new names in the mix as Congress moseys back to square one, even with this international crisis overseas and a key deadline here at home less than a month away. Plus, a manhunt for the suspect accused of targeting and killing a judge in his own driveway. What we know tonight about the man who police say is armed and dangerous. Plus, the one-two punch of hurricanes brewing off both coasts and where extreme weather's headed next later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight, two Americans kidnapped in that terror attack by Hamas two weeks ago are now free, safe in Israel, according to officials. What could be a major breakthrough in this war, and this moment you are looking at here, this is the first image we are seeing of the mother and daughter, Judith and Natalie Ranan, seen here in a photo released by the Israeli government just minutes ago. You can see them here. They were released right along the border between Israel and Gaza. And a key U.S. official says they are reuniting with their families as we speak right now. Secretary of State Tony Blinken talking in just the last hour. Listen. We expect a team from the U.S. Embassy to uh, see them very shortly. Uh, over the coming hours, they'll receive any uh, support and assistance that they need. And, of course, we're very anxious to be able to reunite them with their loved ones. As meaningful as this moment is for that family, keep in mind that there are still nearly 200 other hostages believed to have been held by Hamas still, including some of, according to the secretary, some of the 10 Americans who are still believed to be missing as we speak. The IDF says most of the hostages are still alive, and this release could it could maybe be a sign of potential de-escalation, even as Israel warns that a new phase of this war is still coming. We will continue to target members of this organization wherever they're at, and we're gearing for the next stages of war. In Gaza, more bombs falling. Key aid still held up. The humanitarian crisis there still intensifying, with Israel sending more troops and more tanks to the border. Throughout the region, 3,900 are believed to be dead in Gaza, 1,400 dead in Israel, as this war now enters almost two weeks. I want to bring in now our Matt Bradley in Lebanon and Josh Letterman, who is on the ground in Tel Aviv. Josh, I want to start with you. And obviously this huge news developing almost minute by minute over the course of the last three hours here. These hostages released, but still so many questions about the negotiations to get them out and whether this could be meaningful in a positive way for the other hostages still being held. What do we know? Well, it certainly is optimistic because it shows, Hallie, that Hamas is not opposed to releasing civilian hostages. And we had heard Hamas say that over the last several days. In fact, they had floated several scenarios, if you will, in which civilian hostages, first they said the non-Israeli ones, the foreigners, and then they kind of opened the door to all civilian hostages, could be released if Israel were to halt the airstrikes, sort of declare a unilateral uh, ceasefire. Uh, and we've heard Hamas again tonight uh, reiterate an offer along those lines, saying they are willing to close the civilian file. That's their way of saying, essentially, get rid of those Israeli and, uh, and, and foreign national hostages who are civilian. Uh, if the security conditions are right, meaning if Israel stops bombarding the Gaza Strip. Uh, we also heard tonight from the Qatari foreign ministry spokesperson uh, talking about what it took to get this deal in place, saying that it took continuous days of discussions with the Israelis, well, with Hamas, uh, but also saying that they do hope that this will just be uh, the start of a process that will see the rest of those hostages released as well. And the Qataris also saying they all believe that or hope that this will also lead to a possibility for de-escalating this crisis, which seems to be uh, alluding to a uh, hope that Israel will now stop short and, and pull back from that ground incursion that really, for the last days, have seemed imminent, Hallie. 
Josh, I want you to stand by here. I'm joined now by our chief Washington correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, because, Andrea, you are fresh, fresh off the, uh, the press conference there at the State Department with the Secretary of State. And to Josh's point here, a critical moment. Talk through what you're hearing and where this goes. Uh, I, I asked the Secretary of State about the Hamas statement with all the caveats that they're a terror group and we don't attach any credibility to what they say. But does their comment to Richard Engel, you know, and others and publicly now, that if the airstrikes stop, they'll release the other civilians, including the Americans, not the Israeli soldiers. That is their, their caveat. But there are a lot of other hostages from other countries. And he said categorically, unconditionally, the hostages have to be released Every man, woman, yeah. and child now. He would not. There was give no it all. even there nod was no to the it. idea of, it, of a potential de escalation. And what's so interesting is that in the president's remarks publicly and privately, they were urging caution on the ground invasion. They were saying, you know, there are alternatives. Uh, according to my reporting, you know, can you go in and go out? Can you leave corridors for aid? Throughout this ground invasion, we know you have to do it. We're not telling you what to do, but. They, he said in his comments, the president did when he was leaving Israel, uh, our military advisors are here in advising and don't do what we did after 9-11 when we took out the leadership of the terror group. As you know, I'm just paraphrasing his thoughts here. And uh, then we made mistakes. The American president acknowledging mistakes after 9-11 with what we did in Iraq which led to us being there, you know, for decades, for 20 years between Iraq and Afghanistan. And they're not telling Israel to pull back. But I think that this is a moment, and there's no question that Israel has to be mindful of the hostages, as well as the imperative that all Israelis feel to go in and respond because of October 7th, and they don't feel they've responded yet. U.S. officials are also going out of their way, and we saw this from the secretary, to thank the Qataris in the Absolutely. negotiation process here. That's an important role. It's so important because in the president's statement, he thanked Qatar, he said in the written statement, I'm th that he was thanking Qatar in partnership right. with Israel instead of separately. So in partnership with Israel, and I asked the secretary about that, does that mean that there could still be a resurrection of some kind of peace agreement? And he said that they were, you know, always looking toward that, that maybe that still could happen. They're never ruling that out. I just think all the signals here are that privately there has to be a moment of, if not a pause, but of targeting the airstrikes. And I think this would most likely not be the moment when the ground invasion would start. Yeah. Uh, Andrea Mitchell. I'm writing this down because I want to talk about it with Josh, but I know you have to get going. You have more reporting to do. We will see you later tonight, I know, on NBC Nightly News. Thank you We are so grateful much. to you for your time tonight. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. And let me just say, throughout all of this, Hallie, it's just been extraordinary. Thank you. On News Now. It's thank just you. been incredible from you. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's very on the Andrew, thank you. I want to get back to Josh Letterman now because, Josh, you know, I want to get to a couple of things that we pulled on with Andrea there, but you have a new statement now from the Israeli Prime Minister into us just in the last 30 seconds. Tell us more. Yeah, just to pick up right where Andrea left off in terms of is Israel going to have to pump the brakes on that ground incursion? Are they going to have to be mindful uh, of the fact that there are still those hostages uh, in harm's way, Hallie? We're hearing tonight from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The statement's super short, so I'll read it to you. He says, two of our kidnapped are home. We will not relent in our effort to return all of the kidnapped at the, and the missing. At the same time, we will continue our fight to victory. And so Prime Minister Netanyahu seems to be suggesting that while Israel is going to continue trying to bring those Americans and other hostages home, that there's not going to be any kind of a unilateral ceasefire, that they are not going to uh, pull back from their plans. Netanyahu previously has defined victory uh, as the complete elimination of the Hamas political and military leadership. And so we're hearing from the Israeli government tonight kind of doubling down on their mission set here, uh, which suggests that Israel is not going to necessarily uh, throw away the playbook of what they have wanted to accomplish in the Gaza Strip, notwithstanding the fact that there now appears to be this diplomatic channel open, uh, this prospect for bringing more hostages home safely, Hallie. 
Um, it is interesting to hear the dynamic that the prime minister is laying out, if, if not altogether unsurprising, Josh, based on what we'd heard from the Israeli military earlier today, because every indication had been that they are going to continue to press forward with the potential for a ground attack into Gaza here. Um, I'd like your thoughts here, based on the reporting that you're doing, and I know the many people that you're talking to, on what that kind of recalibration would look like. It's a good question. Is there going to be a pause now for a little bit more time to see whether they're able to make more progress in the hostage negotiations before going into Gaza? Or are there tactical on the ground shifts that they can make in terms of how they actually carry that out? One of the most urgent things, Hallie, that the Israeli government is going to want to do right now is debrief those two Americans who were just released. Say, what do you know about who had you in the Gaza Strip? where you were being held in the Gaza Strip, uh, what was the protections and the types of uh, armaments that were around you, uh, what intelligence can they extract from those Americans who were just released, both about the military situation there and the location of the hostages so they can try to keep them from harm's way as they continue with this military operation. Josh Letterman, live for us in Tel Aviv. Josh, I know we'll be talking again with you as the story continues to develop. I appreciate it. The two Americans we're talking about, Judith and Natalie, are members of the extended family of somebody that we know here in our NBC News family. Our former Tel Aviv bureau chief, our former NBC News correspondent, Martin Fletcher, who is with us here. He's been with us through much of the day. Uh, and in fact, Martin, in the last 24 hours since you found out that these family members had been held hostages, held hostage to now, and they've been released, Martin, I have to ask you, how are you doing? How is your family? What do you know? Well, I've got to say, Hallie, I'm doing fine. The family is celebrating. I think the, the, they, were, they were holding off on the celebrations before they knew what kind of condition um, Judith and Natalie were in, because the, it's, it's one thing to be released, but who knows what happened to them. Right. So by judging by the photographs that we can see, boy, they look tired and exhausted um, and no doubt tra tra traumatized, but they seem to be in good physical condition from what we can see from these photographs. Um, you know, this is a young woman in her teens and a, and a, and a her young mother. What have they been through? So as Josh said, the next thing is going to be debriefing by the Israeli mil military and intelligence sources. And um, well, you know, time to celebrate. But I can also tell you that today the same family or my family, my extended family, buried one person who was killed in the attack and another member is still a hostage in Gaza, you know, so yeah. so um, it's something to celebrate and, and but not everything by a long way yet. And yeah. many other, you know, we're celebrating most families are not. You make an important point about um, the long road ahead for so many other families. I want to have you put on your sort of um, Middle East analyst hat in just a second here, but keep that, you know, Martin Fletcher husband hat on for me for just a second <laughs> longer because, you know, as, you're, if you, as you've been through this process, I know it's been deeply emotional, deeply intense for your wife, for her extended family here. Is there any further insight into the negotiations into getting them released, what they experienced while they were in Hamas captivity here. I imagine those are questions that the Israeli government, the Israeli intelligence services are going to want to know uh, and, and part of the process of them reacclimating after being under duress for so long. Yeah, you know, this question about being a hostage and then released, I mean, they're not the first person in his, people in history to go through this. It's going to be long, it's going to be traumatic, it's going to be dramatic, they're going to need a, a lot of uh, psychological support. But the first question is simply going to be, as I mentioned earlier, intelligence. And as Josh said, this is what this is critical. Where were they held? How many people were holding them? Were they in a group of three or four or 15 or 20? Was it like three or four Hamas fighters in a tunnel under the ground looking after just a, a handful? You know, Israel's task now is to, on the one hand, prosecute the ground war. On the other hand, try to reduce as, poss as much as possible the number of hostages who are going to be killed in that ground war. Because we know from the Hamas documents that Hamas is message to its own people was to kill the hostages who were being difficult and to use the others as human shields. So mm -hmm. the remaining hostages, that's the situation they're in. They will, they will be human shields. And Israel, while prosecuting the ground war, number one priority will be to win the war. And what happens in getting there is going to be tough on everybody. How do you see the Israeli military, if at all, doing a recalibration here from, as you say, prosecuting the ground war while also holding in balance the possibility that now that the door has cracked open to the release of at least two hostages, your family members, there could be the release of more? 
Well, I, I think that Israel will probably be on, you know, mixed feelings, but it's an advantage for Israel in one sense, in that, in that the reason we haven't seen a ground invasion so far is probably because Israel and the United States and other allies are still gaining intelligence, trying to find out where are the hostages, what condition are they in. So that's, that's and also other elements that they need to recheck. When you talk about recalibration, don't forget one thing, Israel totally, utterly miscalculated and got it wrong about the invasion. So they must be looking at their uh, intelligence that they've got so far and reassessing what they already know. So there is a lot of intelligence work to be done before the troops actually go in. Can I just ask you, Martin, and I know you have so much on your plate at this moment here, but can you just take a step back for a second? And I know that you are just one family out of so many who is who has gone through, frankly, um, a, a living hell over the past couple of weeks, not knowing what has happened to your relatives, not knowing what's happening with the people you love. But can you just take a moment to, you know, 5.15 Eastern time now, it's been about three hours since you've learned of this news, um, to reflect on where you are? Well, me personally, I mean... I can't separate my own family from the other families. <clears throat> I know it yeah. sounds like I'm trying to be noble, but I'm not. It's just a fact. Yeah. Great. My family is celebrating. As I said before, my family has another hostage inside Gaza anyway. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, if those groups, if the hostages are being held in groups of three or four or five, which I imagine to be the case, that's like 50 different places where hostages are being held throughout Gaza. Mm. How do you find them? They couldn't find one Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, when he was held by Hamas for five years in Gaza. They couldn't find one guy in five years. I'm not sure how they're gonna find 200 in five days. Martin Fletcher, uh, we're so glad uh, to have you with us tonight, uh, especially tonight. And uh, a lot of people around the country and around the world are thinking of you and all those other families affected by this war. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. We know that Israel has also put out a new threat to that Lebanese militant group we've talked about here, Hezbollah. That's on the northern border, right, to Israel and Lebanon. Warning Hezbollah, do not test us, essentially. Do not test our military power. That's the message the Israelis are given. As the fighting is intensifying between these two groups, trading fire nearly daily, the worst escalation in nearly 20 years, creating fears that this regional conflict now could get even bigger. I want to bring in Matt Bradley in Lebanon. Matt, bring us up to speed here. Yeah, so, Hallie, we, we went to some interesting protests today. They were a little different, and this was the same as what we've been seeing the last couple of weeks. This is Friday prayers, and everybody who is at the mosque today, they spilled out on the streets, and you saw this throughout the world from Morocco to Iraq, and even in Western capitals all over the place, we saw, we saw these huge protests, but this one was a little different here in Lebanon. This was... Palestinians. There were Palestinian refugees or the descendants of Palestinian refugees. There are camps of refugees all over the Muslim world. People who fled from Israel or were expelled from Israel when it was founded all the way back in 1948. Their descendants now number in the millions throughout the region. And so we went and we spoke to some of them. They were protesting. So this was a protest that was sparked not by Hezbollah, which I've been talking to you about every night since this conflict began, but by Hamas. They have a presence here in southern Lebanon, too. And some of these young men, they were filled with passion and anger. And they said, I talked to them, they said they want to go to war. They'll go to war with Hezbollah across this border here with Israel. And, of course, these are young men. You know, they're filled with passion and anger. And, but they're seeing the same images that we're seeing. They're seeing people rising up in protest, Arabs, but also, again, in Western countries as well, in anger. Uh, and they believe that now that they're going to have this huge upswell of rage and people who are going to back them if they go into war. So these young men were telling me that they are willing to pick up a gun, willing to fight, and they believe that the entire Arab and Muslim world is behind them. So these are images that we're all seeing. And, you know, this is a really dangerous moment for the entire region if these protests, and they're just protests for now, right. and I asked them, you know, th there's a difference between going out to a protest and going to war. But once that gulf is bridged, we could start to see a really dangerous situation where we start to see a lot of countries, not just Lebanon, but throughout the region, starting to fight. Matt Bradley, live for us in Lebanon. Matt, we'll be looking for more updates from you, I know, throughout the evening. Thank you.
The White House today is asking Congress for more than $105 billion in new money to help Israel, but to also help Ukraine and to go towards some other national security needs. This is after the president's primetime speech to Americans last night, calling that money a smart investment that'll pay off, essentially, for American security for generations. You see the breakdown here, $60 billion for Ukraine, $14 billion for Israel, the rest going towards humanitarian help, Indo-Pacific help, the border fighting the fentanyl crisis here. So it's a variety of things, but again, the focus, Israel here. The reality of this is none of it really even matters uh, if, in fact, we get a Speaker of the House. And that is because not a dollar can go to the things that it needs to go to until there is a House Speaker in place so Congress can approve it. And I have to tell you, Friday night here, it's not looking like anything's going to happen until at least early next week. That's because House Republicans have said, nope, Jim Jordan's not our guy. He is no longer their speaker candidate as of tonight. There are a bunch of people now throwing their names into the ring as Congress essentially ambles on back to square one starting early next week to figure out who will lead them. There is a Sunday deadline for members to file. And you already have a lot of people expressing some interest. You see some of them here. Ryan Nobles is on Capitol Hill. Ali Rafa is outside the White House for us covering all the latest. Ryan, let me start with you here. So... It begins anew, it feels, right? <laughs> Kevin McCarthy couldn't be speaker. Steve Scalise couldn't be speaker. Jim Jordan couldn't be speaker. They didn't have the votes, none of them. Who is going to? Is it going to be Kevin Hearn? Is it going to be Tom Emmer? Like, help us understand this. I think that's an open question right now, Hallie. I think you're absolutely right uh, when you say that this is back to square one. It's as if uh, this contest is starting afresh and anew. And maybe that's exactly what the Republican conference needs right now, because this whole back and forth of trying to replace Kevin McCarthy in midstream seemed to be poisoned from the very beginning. So they've decided to, to leave, uh, go to their respective quarters this weekend. If someone's interested in the job, they can put their name in by Sunday. They'll have a candidate forum on Monday. Monday night with the hope of having an internal conference vote on Tuesday morning. If they emerge with someone who's a clear favorite, then perhaps they can head to the floor. Of course, all of, of this is, is once again against the backdrop in that same huge problem that there isn't anyone yet that has emerged with the ability to win over 217 votes. But maybe with a fresh set of eyes, a new pitch from this new crop of candidates, that will change. Uh, it's something that we're not going to know for sure until early next week. Um, okay, I hear you. Big picture, right? That puts us now, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, five days closer to that government mm -hmm. shutdown deadline. Um, and I hate to ask you to predict things because I know you don't have a crystal ball and there's a lot that's unpredictable here. Is it your sense, though, that there is at least an appetite to get a House speaker before we start to get into real um, primal scream territory for out of the <laughs> shutdown? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's no doubt that everybody wishes that they could put a speaker in place, right? Nobody's happy that we're in this current situation. The problem is that nobody can agree on who the best person is for that job. And they're really kind of entrenched uh, in their own corners when it comes to picking that person. So there's no doubt a sense of fatigue. You, uh, I see a, a massive sense of frustration amongst these individual members, really kind of upset with themselves that they can't come to a conclusion as to who the next person will be. But I also think there's a kind of an overwhelming sense here that this is laying the groundwork for the way that Congress is going to operate, not just over the next couple of weeks where they have to tackle these big issues that you laid out, but that this could set the stage for how Congress is going to operate for a very long time. And what I think the reason that you see these moderates, uh, you know, the more establishment members of the Republican Party kind of digging in their heels right now and, and rejecting someone like Jim Jordan is because they don't want to set a precedent that five or six people can determine the fate of the entire conference. So the hope here is that they can all kind of lick their wounds after this battle and come up with someone that they can, they can agree upon so that we're not in this place continually month after month going forward. Ryan Nobles, thank you very much. I know there's a lot of balls to juggle there on the uh, on Capitol Hill. Thanks. Ali Rafa, let me bring you in. And a couple of questions here. First, let's start on the possibility of moving forward this package here, this money that Israel wants, obviously, as it fights this war with Hamas and potentially prepares to escalate to a ground invasion at some point. We don't know when. Um, how much is the White House sort of pushing in the background on the levers to try to get this moving? 
Yeah, Hallie. Well, I think it was interesting when you listened to the president's primetime address last night from the Oval Office, you could almost hear based on his tone at what points he was talking to the American public and at what point uh, he was talking to lawmakers on Capitol Hill, who some of them he has to convince how important this is and the stakes that surround uh, this aid package. You heard him talk about how this is an inflection point, uh, how this sets up uh, an investment for not just now, but generations to come. He talked about uh, the message that uh, it would be sent if the, the U.S. does not provide this support to these countries in their most critical times of need. And I think OMB Director Shalonda Young said it most clearly. She said on a call with reporters this morning when this was announced that the White House has done everything it can do, everything it had promised. Now all of this is in Congress's hands. And the White House thinks this package has a good chance uh, of passing, of getting widespread support because of the widespread support we have seen from both sides of the aisle for Israel since this war broke out almost two weeks ago now. Uh, and they're hoping that the support for Israel would be able to potentially offset any losses in support uh, from some people who don't think that the U.S. should continue to provide military aid for Ukraine as we continue to see uh, American support for that wane in recent months. Uh, but the White House is uh, hoping that this is enough and they're optimistic that this is enough to get this uh, passed, especially given the urgency. However, we're not seeing that urgency reciprocated uh, in the House, as you heard Ryan mention. We also know that the president has been engaged, of course, with the release of these two hostages now, now former hostages from the hands of Hamas after they were kidnapped in that terror attack just about two weeks ago. And we understand, based on that interview that our colleague Kristen Welker just did with the top White House official, the president held a pretty emotional phone call with that family. Yeah, we're learning just a few minutes ago that the president has spoken with the family members of these two hostages that have been released, this American mother and daughter. Uh, and we know that the president is still in active and ongoing conversations with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. They shared a phone call earlier today, uh, as well as officials uh, from Qatar and from Israel who are still in the process of working out any sort of behind the scenes negotiations to be able to get uh, the 10 other Americans who are still unaccounted for and believed to be among the more than 200 hostages that are being held in Gaza by Hamas. Ali. Ali Rafa, live for us outside the White House. Thank you so much. Coming up, a whole lot more to get to on what has turned into a very active, a very busy Friday evening here. We're going to go one-on-one -on -one with a Republican congressman who's trying to laugh through the tears on Capitol Hill. We'll ask him about his spicy tweets and who can actually get to 217 in his conference. Plus, Halloween on the picket line by sag after members will be staying out of character as their strike continues. Stay with us. Why yet another co-defendant of former President Trump is coming to a plea deal with prosecutors. We've got that just ahead in the five things. But first, we know, and we've talked about it here, over on Capitol Hill, a lot of chaos. It's a cliche, but in this instance, it happens to be true. But one member of Congress is trying to laugh through the tears, if you will. <laughs> Congressman Mike Collins, meme lord these days, posting things like um, a play off The Simpsons, right? Say the line, a speaker is not elected. You probably know that meme. Then this one, did you kick out the speaker? Yes. What did it cost? Everything. Or his latest, when the comms director gets back from her wedding week off, y'all, please tell her I've been behaving. I want to bring in now the person behind it all, Republican Congressman Mike Collins. Um, I I don't know that anybody can tell her you've been behaving, Congressman. You've been loose and fast on the Twitter account lately. Well, it's been uh, it's been trying to bring a little bit of levity to uh, so, a very serious moment in time. But so that's what it is, right? I mean, is this an yeah. instance where you are kind of laughing through the pain here? It is, and, and I think it's been a help. You know, I'm from the South, and we've got a couple of good old Southern comedians down there, old Jeff Foxworthy, and we had old Louis Grizzard, so we're known for just putting a little bit of uh, humor into any situation, and I think it was just a good time to do that. Do your colleagues like it, or are they annoyed by it, honestly? Oh, no, they, they are loving it. As a matter of fact, uh, we've even had some of them trying to, uh, to send in their own request on what they want to see posted out there. So it's, it's, been, uh, it's been really good. And unfortunately, we still don't have a speaker. That's but, right. But uh, we'll get back at it on Monday, and, and good Lord willing, we'll get one in the, in the seat, and we'll get back to doing the people's business up here. So 
Let's talk about that, right? What happens come Monday? There is a, a, a healthy list of people who are, if not outright declaring themselves yeah. candidates, at least saying that they're interested in the job. So let me ask you, I know that the next step seems to be this meeting on Monday evening where you and your conference will hash some of this out. Who would you like to see go up for the job here? You know, Hallie, I've not made any bones about it. I'm looking for someone to help run this place like a business. That's what I said when I campaigned. I wanted to come up here. I'm in private business, been in that all of my life for 30 plus years in the trucking industry. And that's what I want, someone to lay this thing out as a plan, a plan going forward on when we're going to have a schedule, lay that out. We're going to handle these bills and these appropriations at this time, and then we move forward. And when I see that person, then uh, we'll, we'll either get behind them wholeheartedly or we'll listen to the whole crowd and then we'll make our pick. It's going to take a while, though, because it looks like we may have 50 percent of the conference running here before this thing's over. I mean, no kidding. Could I, I just want to say respectfully, Congressman, you just <laughs> described who you'd like to see as the speaker candidate. Does that person exist? Does, is that I a real person in your conference? And who is it? Well, we'll wait and see. Um, I think we've got a very deep bench, a lot of very good people, and I uh, look forward to hearing from them. Look forward to hearing what they have to say and put that plan forward, because I think that's some of the things that I felt that as a freshman that I've been missing is kind of been sitting up here and we're, we're, we've been floating along. And so I look forward to getting engaged and, and having some input and make sure that we do lay out for the American people exactly where we're going and when we're going to accomplish that and when we're going to get it done. Are you hearing from your constituents about this? One of the things I found interesting, we have teams in the field asking voters about this. And in the early days of this crisis domestically here with no speaker, there were some people who were like, listen, I don't really even know who Kevin McCarthy is. How much is this penetrating for people in your district? No, you're exactly right. You know, the majority of the people they want us to get our job done. They understand that there's high inflation, there's high interest rates, there's high unemployment. They know that we have $32 trillion in debt and counting. And, and we only have, we've got a very short job description up here. Take your constituents and have oversight of the federal government. And then that is to pass those appropriation bills. And we've got them teed up. We just need to go ahead and kick them out. Granted, it's late, but they're saying, why are you not at work? We need to be at work doing the business and getting the people's debt under control and getting this federal government operating in the right direction again. Part of that work is going to include figuring out the response to the international crisis unfolding overseas that we spent the first 30 yeah. minutes of our show talking about here. Of course, the war between Israel and Hamas after that terror attack on October 7th. The White House has now sent over this $100 billion money aid package, essentially. It includes money for both Israel and Ukraine. As it stands, is that something that you would support? No, I will not support it. We, we, I am wholeheartedly behind Israel, always will be. And if we want to support Israel separately, that's good. I'm not in for supporting Ukraine anymore. The European Union, they need to step up to the plate if they want to support Ukraine and do that. If, we've, if we want to look at, at funding and trying to, to get rid of an invasion, Let's support and fund our border wall down there and get that invasion that we have on our southern border under control. But this no package more does include border, border money, Congressman. No, it, yes, it does. But right now, this administration is spending border money on putting people in hotels, giving them food, giving them phones, and putting them up for a couple of years. And that's what's got to stop as well. You know, we need to spend okay. money on border for border okay. wall. Congressman Mike Collins, um, I know that you have no sense of timeline. What is your act? Do you think maybe by next week this will be over? Just uh, you know what? Guess. I, I would love to. Say, I would love to say Monday that we'll have somebody. Hopefully by Wednesday, you know, midweek we will have a, a candidate and we'll be out there voting. Good Lord, when we need to, we need to get back to work for the American people. Congressman Mike Collins, thank you for being with us tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, former President Trump's. Former campaign legal advisor making a plea deal with prosecutors in that Georgia election interference case. Kenneth Chesbro pleading guilty, facing five years of probation, a $5,000 fine, and 100 hours of community service. This deal also means that he's got to testify in any future trials, including potentially against the former president himself. He now becomes the third former Trump attorney to come to a plea deal with Fulton County prosecutors. We're watching that. Number two, speaking of former President Trump, a judge is finding him five 
$5,000 and threatening to throw him behind bars after he violated a partial gag order in his New York civil fraud trial. Remember that gag order we talked about? Well, the judge had said in that instance, hey, you've got to take down this truth social post where you attack my law clerk. This was the judge's message to the Trump team. But an image was left up on the former president's website, apparently, for a couple of weeks. The former president's attorney apologized, said it was a mistake, not on purpose. Number three, Spirit Airlines canceled something like 100 flights today to inspect some planes. The airline didn't explain the nature of those inspections, but says this is a process that's going to take days, meaning days, plural, not just one day. The FAA says it is aware of Spirit's decision and that it was for a mandatory maintenance inspection. Number four, we now seem to know more about why billions of snow crabs are disappearing from the ocean around Alaska. It's because the water is getting hotter because of climate change. A new study says that warmer water probably led to the crabs starving to death. This is just two days after Alaska canceled its snow crab harvest season altogether for the second year in a row because there just aren't enough crabs. Number five, the Hollywood Actors Union is telling its members not to dress up as characters from big movies and big productions for Halloween this year. The SAG After Union says if you do, you could be promoting the work of the companies you're striking against. Instead, they told members, hey, wear something generic, like a zombie or a ghost or a generic witch, let's say. Tomorrow is the actor's 100th day on strike. Coming up here on the show, new hurricanes brewing off both coasts. The information we're just getting into us in the last few minutes about these severe storms. Plus, a lot more on our top story. Two American hostages released by Hamas. We're going to take you live to their hometown in Illinois, where people are starting to see some of the first glimmers of hope. Relief tonight for the family and friends of the two Americans we told you about. Formerly hostages, now in just the last maybe five, six hours, released by Hamas and safely in Israel. This is the image that we're seeing of them in a photo released by the Israeli government. Mother and daughter, Judith and Natalie Renan, kidnapped by Hamas in that terror attack two weeks ago. The State Department confirming today that they were released right along the border of the Gaza Strip there. They're now reuniting with family in Israel as we speak. The relief their family is feeling also reflected just outside Chicago in a suburb there where these women live, 1759. Maggie Vespa is joining us now from Evanston. And Maggie, um, really a meaningful moment for so many in Evanston. I know you had a chance to speak with Natalie and Judith's rabbi, right? Tell us more. Yeah, exactly. That's why we're standing here. We just spoke to him in the last hour or so. I've also talked to a friend of Judith's over the phone. Everybody here just saying for the first time in weeks, they are going to get a good night's sleep tonight. Mm. The relief is just rippling through this community. They've spent weeks in agony, just like the families that, you know, really uh, have remained really tight lipped throughout this entire thing. We've spoken mainly to the rabbi throughout all of this and kind of to friends uh, who know these two. They learned with the rest of the world that Judith and Natalie were being released that uh, by Hamas today. Day, and they're waiting, just like everybody else, on pins and needles for updates on their condition uh, and basically a timeline for when they'll be able to reunite uh, with these two who are so important to the community here. And the rabbi says uh, they've, been, they've been a part of his congregation for so long. It's just something that everybody here is processing in real time with the rest of the world. Take a listen to part of what the rabbi had to say just a few minutes ago. As much as we are so grateful that Judith and Natalie have been released, we are also certain that we are talking about evil people, an evil group that needs to be eradicated and that needs to be removed from Gaza. Yeah, the rabbi quick to refocus there um, again on so many that are still being held hostage. You know, at the same time, also something that we asked about was the timeline. Obviously, you know, Hallie, um, NBC's Martin Fletcher, who you spoke to earlier, went on TV last night on 11th hour on MS and said that uh, Natalie and Judith are relatives of his, relatives of his wife. And suddenly, less than 24 hours later, they're released. I asked the rabbi if he thinks that that timeline is a coincidence, that suddenly these higher profile hostages were released. He simply said, I think that our prayers have been answered. Mm. Hallie. Maggie Vespa, we're so glad to have you there with so many in the community waiting to welcome back Judith and Natalie with open arms. Maggie, thank you so much for being there.
NBC News covers hundreds of other stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, teachers in Portland have just voted to authorize a strike there in Oregon after the union and the school district couldn't come to terms on a new contract. It's going to start November 1st, meaning all the classes, most extracurriculars are going to stop. Teachers, educators have been pushing for more money, for smaller class sizes, and for more resources. Also out of our Western Bureau, a Colorado funeral home where nearly 200 decaying bodies were found earlier this month may have been giving families fake ashes and false cremation certificates, according to an AP investigation. The dates on those certificates, they say, didn't match up with records from two crematories. NBC News has not independently confirmed those details. No charges have been filed yet while the funeral home's owners are cooperating with law enforcement. And out of our Midwest Bureau, a kids football team in St. Louis had to cancel its season after a player's father allegedly shot the team's coach. The shooting was reportedly over the parent's son not getting a starting position on the team. The coach survived. But witnesses, according to police, say the shooting happened after the two men got into a fight at a team practice. Lots more to come here on the show, including the manhunt for a suspected murderer who targeted a judge in Maryland. What we're just learning tonight about the victim, just hours after his ruling against the suspect in court. Right now, police are looking for a suspect who they say shot and killed a Maryland judge in his own driveway in a targeted attack after the judge ruled against him in a divorce case. Look at this. Police are just releasing these pictures of the alleged shooter and the car that they think he's driving. Warning, he may be armed and dangerous. Listen. This was a targeted attack on Judge Wilkinson. Uh, we've identified Pedro Argote, 49, of Frederick, Maryland, as a suspect in this case. Argote is not in custody and is considered armed and dangerous. We're a small community here, close knit, knit so we, uh, we pull together when something like this happens. You're seeing Judge Andrew Wilkinson here. He presided over a hearing in the suspect's divorce case, giving his wife custody of their kids just hours before the judge was allegedly shot and killed. Officials say the judge's wife and son were inside the house. They were home when this happened. I want to bring in Tom Costello, who's following this one for us. So, Tom, what else do we know about the search for the suspect? It is very much a, a, a manhunt that involves yeah. local authorities, state troopers, as well as uh, the U.S. Marshals. This is a very high-profile case. Uh, this gentleman is thought to have killed a judge, uh, a 52-year-old judge. Mm. He himself has children and a wife at home. That's the suspect right there, as we mentioned, Pedro Argote. Listen, he had just lost custody of his four children that day. The judge had given custody to his ex-wife, and there was a history of domestic violence there. So for whatever reason, he then allegedly showed up at the judge's house and murdered him in his driveway, the judge's wife and son inside the house at the time. This is a high priority. The, may the governor of Maryland just tweeting out that he is re absolutely repulsed by this, mm -hmm. and it is a high priority for the state, and that becomes obviously a big deal for federal authorities, too. This is the kind of case that sends chills down the spines of others who are part of the judicial branch in moments like this, right? Because this is the absolutely. nightmare scenario for somebody um, like a judge in this instance making a ruling like yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. We went and looked, by the way, at the numbers of cases or threats, I should say, against federal judges. He was not a federal right. judge, but federal judges. 4,500 threats in 2021. That was the high watermark. That was post the election, of course. And then it came down to about 1,300 or so last year. So these numbers have trended down, and, but we have had occasional homicides involving judges. Nonetheless, you heard the sheriff talking about the need to find this suspect. Last night, initially, in the preliminary investigation, we, we had no idea the information was coming in. So we placed uh, officers and troopers at the local judges here in the county at their residence just as a precaution initially, and they stayed there through the night till this morning. But we, we don't feel that there's any threat currently to other judges in the county or the state. Yeah, to reiterate, the suspect is still armed and dangerous, and they don't know where he is right now. Tom Costello, uh, again, just a chilling case. Thank you for bringing us up to speed on all those developments. You bet. Appreciate it. Tonight, the East Coast is getting soaked again right at the start of the weekend with rain expected to hit the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, New England, as we are seeing hurricanes in both the Atlantic and the Pacific brewing off both coasts. You've got Norma. 
Now a Category 3, winds up to 120 miles an hour, aiming at Mexico, at Cabo. Um, and in the Atlantic, Hurricane Tammy is aiming at the Caribbean. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens is joining us now. Where is the biggest threat tonight, Bill? Break it down. Uh, as far as uh, life and property, I'd have to say the Cabo area. That's probably going to be the worst of it. That'll be during the day tomorrow. Uh, as far as the Northeast goes, I'd love to stay positive. I'm trying to put a spin on this because it has been miserable weekend after weekend. There's rain tonight from Ohio all the way to Maine. Showers and storms rolling through the Carolinas. But there's no airport delays. So it's not like one of those storms that's causing like you know horrific travel issues. We're not seeing flash flooding. We're not getting property damage or stuff like that. It's just annoying that it's raining again. And this will be a Eight, eight of the nine, eight of the last ten have been in Philadelphia and New York wet. D.C. about half of your weekends this fall, and in Boston, same for you. And this one will obviously be a wet weekend. And the biggest problem financially is all the fall festivities, the apple picking, all of the fall foliage, huge tourist industry throughout northern New England. The leaves are at their peak, and they're just losing just a ton of money weekend after weekend. People are canceling because they don't want to be out there in conditions like this. So on 11 a.m. Saturday, the green it shows you where the light rain is. The yellow and the red's a heavy rain. Notice New York City southwards by 11 a.m., you're done. So it's not a complete washout your entire weekend from Philadelphia to D.C. to southwards. It's really from Hartford to Boston, northern New England. It's an ugly Saturday, and it stays that way right into Sunday. And eventually some of that rain may come back down on you, Boston, as we go through the evening. I know the Patriots have a big football game there during the day, so we'll see how that plays out. And as far as the hurricanes go, Tammy, it looks like it's going to be a glancing blow. A Category 1 in the islands, a lot of infrastructure is kind of built for this. It does actually get stronger after that, but it avoids Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Islands. We're talking about Barbuda and Antigua. Those are the islands that are most at risk of seeing some damage. And as far as our major Category 3 Hurricane Norma goes, this one looks big and impressive. Here's Cabo. It's heading directly north. It'll weaken as it gets there. We're hoping it weakens a lot, but the water is warmer than it should be this time of year. And right now, it looks like they're going to deal with a Category 2 hurricane tomorrow. They've only been hit by a major hurricane four times in recorded history, so this is a big deal. Bill Karens, thank you very much for that update. Coming up here on the show, as we talk about the war right now happening between Israel and Hamas, it is the furthest thing from peace in the region. But that hasn't always been the case. We're taking a look in just a sec. The British Prime Minister meeting with the Egyptian president today, where the Egyptian leader says he hopes talks could potentially pick back up, even in the middle of this war, that could end up leading to peace in the region and perhaps the creation of a Palestinian state. That is a goal that seems very, very far off today, perhaps. But just about three decades ago, the various sides were not quite as far apart as you might imagine. Our NBC's Raf Sanchez has more. As Israel and Hamas descend further into war, the prospects for a broader Israeli-Palestinian peace deal seem further away than ever. But 30 years ago, that peace appearing on the cusp after decades of conflict. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. Neighboring Arab states launching a war against Israel after it was founded. The international community envisioning a Palestinian state, too. But Israel fighting with Arab countries in conflicts like the Six-Day War and Yom Kippur War, alongside clashes with Palestinians, preventing that state from fully emerging. One of Israel's fiercest soldiers in those years, Itzhak Rabin, growing into a warrior of peace after being re-elected prime minister in 1992. Rabin spent many years in the Israeli Defense Forces. He knew the cost of war better than most. Rabin opening a door to negotiations with Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat's Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO. At that time, the PLO designated a terrorist group by the United States and a tumultuous Palestinian uprising called the First Intifada in full swing. After months of preliminary talks, Rabin reluctantly met Arafat in Washington. Bill Clinton had to coach him along and say, I know this isn't easy. I know this has been your enemy for a long, long time, but here's our opportunity uh, and we should grab it. The two, once bitter adversaries, shaking hands and their delegations signing the Oslo Accord. Enough of blood and tears. Enough. The difficult decision we reached together was one that required great and exceptional courage. 
The PLO would recognize Israel's right to exist, and Israel would begin transitioning control of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank to Palestinians. The deal, just the beginning for Rabin. Israel signed a peace treaty with Jordan in 1994, and another Oslo Accord with Arafat in 1995. What could be the most promising step yet toward peace in the Arab lands that Israel has occupied since the 1967 war. That November, Rabin speaking at a giant rally for peace in Tel Aviv. But just as he left the stage, tragedy. Four or five shots rang out and Rabin collapsed into the arms of his security men. Rabin killed, not by a Palestinian, but by a 24-year-old Israeli extremist who opposed the peace process. A blood-stained paper found in his jacket pocket. On it, lyrics of Shir La Shalom, or a song for peace. One he sang on stage just moments before his death. In the days following, a national moment of silence. At 2 o'clock this afternoon, the city of Jerusalem ground to a halt. Rabin's death shocking the world. The world has lost one of its greatest men, a warrior for his nation's freedom, and now a martyr for his nation's peace. I'm very shocked for this awful and terrible crime. The fallout of that traumatic loss in flaming hardliners on both sides of the conflict. Rabin's assassination was a tremendous blow to the peace process. Israel soon drifting rightward in the vacuum of a strong leader pushing for peace. You had Israelis who were in profound doubts about the wisdom of negotiating with the PLO. And Bibi Netanyahu was at the forefront of those with those doubts. Netanyahu coming to power for the first time in 1996. Violence soon flared back up. Bus bombings as part of two more intifadas that killed thousands. Israeli settlement construction ramping up. More peace proposals falling flat. A blockade of Gaza and now another war. But when this war someday ends, perhaps a new generation of leaders will look back at this moment, recognize how close peace felt, and be inspired by some of Rabin's last words. In every central square of every city, scream out and cheer, only for peace. Our thanks to Raf Sanchez for that reporting. That does it for us for this hour, but we've got a lot more coverage coming up right now. Tonight, that breakthrough in negotiations for hostages taken by Hamas with a dramatic, dramatic first look now of the mother and daughter now released, just coming into us here. Here they are, Judith and Natalie Renan, two Americans who have been freed now safely in Israel, their families just off the phone with President Biden. So is this just the beginning? What does this mean for the other roughly 200 hostages? And what about that Israeli ground attack? We're live in Tel Aviv and at the White House with every angle. Plus, in Lebanon, a new warning to Hezbollah from Israel. Israel basically saying, hey, don't try us. What our reporter on the ground is seeing is fighting on the border between those two countries intensifies. And key supplies stuck right now in Egypt, maybe making its way to millions of people, thousands of people in Gaza in the next day or two, according to the president. We're going to explain what's causing the delay with our reporter on the ground in Cairo. Then new drama upending the old drama at the Capitol, which as we speak remains speakerless. The new names in the mix as Congress moseys back to square one, even with this international crisis overseas and a key deadline here at home less than a month away. Plus how one member of Congress is trying to laugh before he cries and all this speaker confusion. The new meme lord and current member, Mike Collins, joining us one-on-one -on -one in just a minute. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight two Americans kidnapped in a terror attack by Hamas are now free, safe in Israel, in what could be a major breakthrough in this war. Look at this. This is the moment here, right? The first image we are seeing of this mom and her daughter, Judith and Natalie Renan, in a photo released by the Israeli government in really just the last hour and 90 minutes or so. They were released along the border of the Gaza Strip, and a top U.S. official says they're reuniting with their families right now. That is happening. As meaningful as this moment is here for that family, and it is, the Secretary of State says that 10 Americans are still missing, some of them believed to be hostages. But this moment could maybe be just the start of moves to get more of those people who have been kidnapped in that terror attack released. The Israeli military says most of the hostages are still alive, and this release may 
may be a sign of a potential moment of de-escalation, even as Israel warns that a new phase of this war is coming. We will continue to target members of this organization wherever they're at, and we're gearing for the next stages of war. In Gaza, more bombs falling. Critical aid still held up, with Israel sending more troops and more tanks to the border. Across the region tonight, at least 3,900 people are believed to be dead in Gaza, 1,400 in Israel. NBC News correspondents Hala Garani and Josh Letterman are on the ground live for us in Tel Aviv. Josh, I want to start with you here because we are just hearing now from the Israeli prime minister just hours after the release of these two American hostages. Bring us up to speed on that and how these now former hostages are doing. Well, all we know about how they're doing, really, Hallie, is from that one photograph that you just showed, uh, in which they look exhausted, but they are walking uh, on their own and certainly delighted and relieved to be back on Israeli soil and out of Hamas captivity. We heard from Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying, look, the U.S. at this point doesn't really have a full picture of how they're doing, that it's going to take some time until uh, the U.S. government is able to do their own assessment, until State Department doctors from the embassy here are able to evaluate evaluate them, uh, the U.S. government pledging all of the support that they're going to need in terms of their medical care and also their psychological care to recover from this harrowing incident. But uh, as you mentioned, we were hearing from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu amid all of these questions about whether the release of these two hostages, with so many more still in captivity, might change Israel's calculus about whether to proceed with that anticipated ground invasion. And Prime Minister Netanyahu, in a very brief statement tonight, uh, says he is calling for the rest of those hostages to be quick released, but he also says that at the same time we continue to fight till victory. And so that seems to be uh, the message that the Israeli government wants to send right now, that this is not going to deter them from carrying out the mission that they have set out, set out to accomplish, Hallie. Josh, thanks. Stand by for me here. Hala, I want to bring you into the conversation right now because this has been a two-week period, not just of obviously an intense military focus, but also an urgent diplomatic scramble. We heard U.S. officials go out of their way to praise the Qataris for their role in some of these negotiations here to get at least potentially these two hostages out. Tell us more about that piece of it. Well, the Qataris have played an important diplomatic role in the release of these hostages. You'll remember earlier this year, they also facilitated the release of American detainees in Iran. They host Hamas. They send hundreds of millions of dollars a year to the Gaza Strip. It wouldn't have been that difficult for them to put a little bit of pressure on Hamas to release these two American hostages. Hamas, as far as it's concerned, feels potentially that this is a way to get a little bit of that Western pressure off of Israel. It off of the group inside of the Gaza Strip. Whether or not that will change the calculus, as Joss was saying, about a potential uh, and expected ground incursion, that remains to be seen. But Qatar is important because it has relationships with Hamas, with Iran, but it also hosts a very important military, American military base in the region, which is used as a uh, headquarter, a hub uh, for operations in the Middle East. And the United States would have, from the very beginning of this crisis, Halley, turned to Qatar to use it as an intermediary yeah. to talk to Hamas to try to get some of these hostages out. And these first two, the hope is this is the beginning potentially of more civilian right. hostage releases. But, um, you know, it just it's just a question of whether or not it will, we will continue in that vein right now. Hala, stand by. Josh, to the point that she's making here, the idea that perhaps this is the beginning of a moment when the dam could break, much of that, it seems, depends on what the Israelis do next as it relates to this potential ground incursion. Talk us through the timeline. Well, what's so fascinating is that we heard from Hamas in a statement tonight suggesting this might not be the end of the hostages that are released, that they are fully prepared to, as they say, close the civilian file, essentially release the remaining civilian hostages while uh, apparently keeping the Israeli troops that are held hostage if Israel were to essentially grant a ceasefire, stop bombarding the Gaza Strip. So far, we're not seeing any indication that Israel's willing to do that. In fact, just in the last few minutes, we heard from the Gaza Interior Ministry saying that Israel has been pounding the Gaza Strip quite hard tonight. Now, we are still awaiting uh, specific comments from the Israeli military about what they might or might not have been doing uh, in the air over the Gaza Strip tonight. But at least uh, according to the Interior Ministry, they're continuing uh, to see airstrikes. And we heard from a Israeli military spokesman speaking to Christian Welker over on Meet the Press Now, suggesting that they have no intention of pulling back from their planned ground invasion, that the strategy remains the same, and that 
Israel does not want to look like its own strategy can be affected or altered by independent decisions being made from Hamas, according to Israel, a terrorist group that is not going to have a veto power over Israel's national security needs, as Prime Minister Netanyahu has laid them out, Hallie. Josh Letterman, live for us in Tel Aviv. Thank you. Halagrani, let me go back to you here. You have covered this region extensively for a long time here. This is an incredibly significant moment for this family, for the family of Judith and Natalie. There are still so many other families who are hoping to get the same kind of good news here. Um, mm -hmm. in, in what has been a very unexpected release here by Hamas um, after their terror attack against Israel. Mm -hmm. Pull back, big picture, Hala. How should we be thinking about this moment? Well, um, I, I think we need to be careful about being optimistic uh, here. Uh, it's two out of uh, 200 hostages. Uh, it, it, as, I, as I said, I think it wouldn't have been very difficult for Qatar to put a tiny bit of pressure on Hamas to release the two hostages. And Hamas is trying to uh, potentially make a gesture that will get some of these, um, some of the pressure on it uh, to be released uh, a little bit. Uh, I think. I think that the, the good news is that what the Israeli military is saying is that they believe that most of the hostages seem to be alive, which means that there is hope for these families, even though early on Hamas did say uh, that some of them had tragically died in some of the bombardments in the early days of the Israeli operation in Gaza. So the hope is that this is the beginning of more civilian releases, although Hamas knows that this is their biggest bargaining chip. We can't forget that. The bargaining chip of holding these civilian and military hostages as well inside of Gaza. And they are going to use them to, you know, get what they can uh, throughout this crisis. Uh, and we'll see. We'll see how they how they go about uh, uh, treating the rest of the hostages and whether or not we'll see more. I think, by the way, I should note one thing. It is interesting that the first two to be released were American. I think that's a message that Hamas is sending as well. Uh, uh, a, me a message and because, an explain that. One. Yeah. Yeah, I think a message to the Americans. They could have released That's two right. dual national French hostages, for instance. I think this is just a significant uh, a, a gesture uh, on the part of Hamas and Qatar, uh, putting pressure on Hamas to try to send a message to the Americans that Hamas is making, you know, is, is sorry, taking a step in the direction of yeah. releasing some of these civilian hostages. Particularly given the relationship, of course, between the U.S. and Israel. Hala Garani, we are grateful to have your expertise here with us mm -hmm. at NBC News. Thank you, Josh Letterman. As always, it is good to see you live in Tel Aviv. Thanks. As we talk about the administration's response here, we're just learning President Biden has now wrapped up a phone call with the families of those hostages. Uh, one top White House official describing the call as emotional not too long ago, right here on this network with our colleague Kristen Walker. Listen. What he said to the families, obviously, uh, the joy in this moment, as you could hear it on the other end of the line, uh, but also the importance that uh, we're very focused on the other families. I want to bring in Ali Rafa, who's live for us outside the White House. And we are just hearing now via uh, social media posts from President Biden that he spoke not just with the families, but with those two Americans specifically, letting them know, he says, that their government will fully support them as they recover and heal. That's right, Hallie. The president speaking with this mother and daughter that were released by Hamas this afternoon, as well as their families. Uh, they were among the families who the president uh, spoke with for over an hour on that Zoom call last week that included White House officials that were updating these families on efforts to find and free their loved ones. And as you mentioned, uh, a White House official said that that was an extremely emotional phone call, that you could hear the relief on the other end of the line when the president talked about this amazing news that their family members uh, were freed by Hamas. Uh, so no doubt the White House, the president is breathing a sigh of relief as well as this, as you heard Josh lay out a few minutes ago, this potentially presents a diplomatic uh, window of opportunity to be able to potentially get uh, what Secretary of State Antony Blinken said today, were 10 other Americans that are still unaccounted for, believed to be among the hostages still in Gaza. And you can imagine the sigh of relief that the president is feeling, as we heard uh, National Security Advisor uh, uh, 
uh, John Kirby last week say that the U.S. was not ruling out the potential for potentially sending in special forces to be able to get these hostages out. So what happens now is just the big question because so much of this relies and hinges on the participation and cooperation with outside factors. You heard the president thank the governments of Qatar and Israel in a statement he issued after the release of these hostages for spearheading this whole effort because the U.S. has not been in direct communication with Hamas throughout this process. So any sort of potential future success in getting hostages out, uh, whether they are American or Israeli, hinges on those two governments, Ali. Ali Rafa, of course, the White House releasing, uh, it appears to be a photograph of the president. Um, I think we can try to show it here in just a second here with a smile on his face as he is on the phone or dialing the numbers, speaking with those two Americans. Obviously, a, a, an incredibly happy moment for their family, but of course, so many difficult moments ahead for the families of those other hostages still being held by Hamas. Ali Rafa, thank you so much. Israel is also putting out a new threat to the north. Not just to Gaza and Hamas to the south, but to Hezbollah up in Lebanon, warning them not to test Israeli military power. That's as fighting escalates between these two groups, trading fire nearly daily. It's the worst it's been in almost 20 years, creating some real concern that this could spark a much bigger conflict in this region, a much bigger war. I want to bring in Matt Bradley, who is live for us now, entire Lebanon. Um, Matt, talk about the potential for this to spiral into a broader regional issue here involving potentially Hezbollah and Lebanon. I mean, and, and I think help people understand, because we've talked about this almost every day since the beginning of this war, since that first Hamas terror attack on Israel on October 7th here. What feels different to you tonight? Yeah, well, I mean, you were, we've been talking about how Hezbollah is so much more sophisticated, so much more powerful even than Hamas. And it, like Hamas, it's backed by Iran. It has directed missiles, unlike the rockets that Hamas has been lobbing across into Israel. They have a ranks and ranks of soldiers who are highly trained, who have experience fighting in Syria for the better part of the past decade. But it's really a lot more than that, Hallie, because, you know, the dominoes would just start falling if Hezbollah were to really enter into this fight. Because remember, there are two aircraft carrier strike groups for the United States Navy parked right off my left shoulder in the eastern Mediterranean. They are there specifically to keep this conflict from internationalizing. And that means it's a not so veiled threat talking about Hezbollah and other Iranian backed groups in the region. So if Hezbollah starts fighting, the U.S. starts striking Hezbollah, that would raise temptations for other actors to join in that are backed by Iran, including Iran itself, that could drag in Israel to shoot missiles or to launch their aggression into other places in the Middle East. That could drag in the entire region, and that would just be a disaster for everybody. What about the evacuations that are happening in the northern part of Israel here? We know that thousands of people are being asked to leave. What's the status there? Do you have any sense? Yeah, I mean, that is what we're, what we're hearing from the Israelis is that could take a couple of days because, you know, we've hmm. been hearing over and over again the slow creep of this buffer zone. It used to be maybe one or two kilometers, then it expanded to a few kilometers more. They evacuated a town called Metula that we were actually watching them doing that. We were watching IDF soldiers from a hill above that running around trying to enforce that order. It looked like they were running around trying to take cover in case they were getting pot shots from the Lebanese side of the border where we were standing. Now, just today, they announced that they're actually going to be evacuating a city, Kiryat Shmona. This is a 20,000 person city, at least that number. And the Israelis have said, this is not a small operation. They are gonna empty out an entire city, the biggest one really in Northern Israel. So that is very serious. And it really is just an indicator of just how rattled the Israelis are about this whole conflict expanding from where I am over the border into Israel. Now, we've been speaking with some Lebanese folks here, and they say their bags are packed, they're ready to go if they get a sense that this could expand. When you talk to people here, they always go back to 2006. That was the last time that, the mm. Hez that Hezbollah fought against the Israelis. It killed, you know, about 1,500 people on either side, and it really brought Lebanon almost to its knees. Hallie? Matt Bradley, live for us there in southern Lebanon tonight. Matt, thank you. The president today says key supplies like food and water and medicine could start getting into Gaza inside the next 24 to 48 hours to help civilians there as the U.S. and Egypt work on ironing out some of the wrinkles in their agreement to make that happen. You see the trucks with all that aid here in these satellite images lined up waiting for the green light to go into Gaza. They're ready to go, ready to roll.
But right now, people in Gaza, the civilians there, are surviving off what little is left after that blockade by Israel, cutting off food, water, electricity, and fuel last week. Megan Fitzgerald has more on what comes next. Well, look, we've been waiting for the last three days for the opening of the Rafah border crossing. And earlier today, we heard from President Biden, who spoke directly to this issue, saying uh, that the crossing is expected to be open in the next 24 to 48 hours. So that puts it in the time frame of this weekend. He also mentioned uh, that there was some construction going on. So keep in mind that the Israelis bombed uh, the Rafah border crossing three times over the last several days. So we know that that is going to be repaired. Also, earlier today, we heard from from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who spoke about how there's some things that are being ironed out. They want to see more shipment going into uh, Gaza and more frequently. So these are things that are being discussed as well. And, and look, he was very passionate when he spoke earlier today, uh, speaking about the urgency of the supplies that are just sitting there on the Egyptian side, waiting to cross over to the more than 2 million Gazans who are desperate for these supplies. I want you to listen into a little bit of what he had to say earlier today. So these trucks are not just trucks. They are a lifeline. They are the difference between life and death for so many people in Gaza. Now, as soon as the Rafah border is opened, again, the president is saying 24 to 48 hours, we suspect we will also see foreign nationals crossing over safely into the Egyptian side. And, of course, that does include Americans. Back to you. Our thanks to Megan Fitzgerald for that reporting from Cairo. So as this international crisis continues to be a crisis, if you will, overseas. There is also a crisis here at home, and that is this. No Speaker of the House, nobody in the Republican conference able to get enough votes to actually lead that chamber of Congress right now. As you see, President Biden speaking from the Oval Office last night, talking about a funding request, money that he wants Congress to pass. Thing is, Congress can't do it because they have nobody to lead them at this point. Jim Jordan has stepped out. Well, I don't know if he's officially, I mean, he's stepped out because nobody's going to vote for him, right? So and not enough Republicans are going to vote for him. He lost something like 25 Republican votes today, meaning somebody else has got to step in. Question is who? There is a lengthy list of people who are considering trying to run for speaker now. But here's the bottom line. Congress is largely back to square one. There's a Sunday deadline for members to officially say that they want to run. Half dozen plus have said they'd be interested. Ali Vitali is live for us on Capitol Hill. Do you know, I don't know if you know baseball, Ali. There's like a thing that they say in baseball. Everybody bats. It means you just go through your lineup. Everybody do it in an inning, right? And it feels like we're in a little bit of an everybody bats situation here when it comes to the speaker race, because now you're seeing a whole bunch of people throw their names into the ring. Kevin McCarthy couldn't do it. He got ousted by some members, right? Small minority of the Republican conference, but enough to kick him out of that yeah. job. Steve Scalise couldn't get enough Republican votes to do it. Republican Jim Jordan couldn't get enough Republican votes to do it. Does that person exist? I have no idea. But truthfully, I'm under the impression right now, Hallie, that everyone wants to run for speaker unless they tell me they don't want to run for speaker. The only person who hasn't told me they don't want to run for speaker right now is Matt Gates. His spokesperson sent me a statement and said Matt Gates is not running for speaker. So cross him off your list. He's the guy who got us in this situation in the first place, Hallie. As for the rest of them, Sounds like we have at least 10 people on our list right now, and it's everything from Jack Bergman, who you've probably never heard of, to Tom Emmer, who is the current whip within the Republican leadership apparatus. But Ali, who so most you've people got a lot have of different also probably options, never heard of. That's exactly right. The conventional wisdom here, though, Hallie, is maybe that's what it takes. Maybe it takes someone with no public baggage and no real vitriol within the conference. I have no idea. I do think that that members have so readily admitted so many times on the record this week that they don't think anyone in their conference can get to 217, that the list can get as long or, frankly, as short as it wants. I don't really have a ton of confidence until we actually see that person get those numbers. The thing that I think a lot of people kind of want to know, right, is like, OK, Ali Vitali, right, Ryan Nobles, Garrett Haig, our Capitol Hill team, like, you all cover it and then come find me when there's actual news, right? When there is yeah. looking like there's going to be a Speaker of the House. Is that going to be potentially, Ali, okay. on Tuesday when we expect, well, when we expect the House to vote? Do you know what I mean? Like, do we think that could be realistically um, the next closest timeline here? Could this stretch another two weeks? <clears throat> 
That's the closest that it could be. So for the optimists who are watching, yeah, let's talk on Tuesday and you could have a new Speaker of the House. And then that would mean that you could actually move forward with the business of governing and legislating. Hmm. I'm just not so sure because there have been several other optimistic inflection points over the course of the last three weeks, and they have all crumbled into chaos, just like we're seeing right now. So I don't know that there's much reason to be optimistic until there's actually reason to be optimistic, because... There were several points this week where on Wednesday we thought Jim Jordan would be able to cobble together the votes that he needed. Then at another point on Wednesday after Jordan failed, it seemed like there could be a real life surge behind the bipartisan bipartisan option of empowering Patrick McHenry. That then quickly fizzled after a few hours. And then you have where we are today on a Friday afternoon where members are flying back home to their districts for the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know that there's much reason to think that Tuesday is going to be the day they get it together. Of course, all of it as the president has sent that aid package over, as we showed just a moment ago, asking for money now for both Israel and Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, as part of that. Ali Vitali, lots to watch, at least hopefully you'll get a weekend, but we'll see you back on Monday. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, billions of snow crabs disappearing from the ocean around Alaska. The new study explaining why later in the five things. But first, we're one on one with a member of Congress, Republican and kind of a memer these days. How he's trying to make people smile even through the mess. So we talked about the chaos that is happening right now at the Capitol. Uh, even some Republicans describe it as just a little bit ridiculous at this point, if you will. And that includes one Republican member who's taking that pretty literally, memeing it. <laughs> online and getting a lot of attention for it. Here's one example from Congressman Mike Collins from Georgia. It's a play on The Simpsons. Say the line, a speaker is not elected, and then cheers. Or this one, did you kick out the speaker? Yes. What did it cost? Everything. Or how about his latest? When the comms director gets back from her wedding week off, this is just a straight-up post, he says, y'all, please tell her I've been behaving. Let's bring in the member behind it all, Republican Congressman Mike Collins. I don't know that anybody can tell her you've been behaving, Congressman. You've been loose and fast on the Twitter account lately. Well, it's been uh, it's been trying to bring a little bit of levity to uh, so, a very serious moment in time. But so that's what it is, right? I mean, is this an instance where you are kind of laughing through the pain here? It is, and, and I think it's been a help. You know, I'm from the South, and we've got a couple of good old Southern comedians down there, old Jeff Foxworthy, and we had a Lewis Grizzard, so we're known for just putting a little bit of uh, humor into any situation, and I think it was just a good time to do that. Do your colleagues like it, or are they annoyed by it, honestly? Oh, no, they, they are loving it. As a matter of fact, uh, we've even had some of them trying to, uh, to send in their own requests on what they want to see posted out there, so it's, it's, been, uh, it's been really good. And unfortunately, we still don't have a speaker. That's but, right. But uh, we'll get back at it on Monday, and, and good Lord willing, we'll get one in, in the seat, and we'll get back to doing the people's business up here. So let's talk about that, right? What happens come Monday? There is a, a, a healthy list of people who are, if not outright, declaring themselves yeah. candidates, at least saying that they're interested in the job. So let me ask you, I know that the next step seems to be this meeting on Monday evening where you and your conference will hash some of this out. Who would you like to see go up for the job? here. You know, Hallie, I've not made any bones about it. I'm looking for someone to help run this place like a business. That's what I said when I campaigned. I wanted to come up here. I'm in private business, been in that all my life for 30 plus years in the trucking industry. And that's what I want. Someone to lay this thing out as a plan, a plan going forward on when we're going to have a schedule. Lay that out. We're going to handle these bills, and these appropriations at this time. And then we move forward. And when I see that person, then uh, we'll, we'll either get behind them wholeheartedly or we'll listen to the whole crowd and then we'll make our pick. It's going to take a while, though, because it looks like we may have 50% of the conference running here before this thing's over. I mean, no kidding. Could I, I just want to say respectfully, Congressman, you just <laughs> described who you'd like to see as the speaker candidate. Does that person exist? Does that, is that a real person in your conference? And who is it? Well, we'll wait and see. Um, I think we've got a very deep bench, a lot of very good people, and uh, look forward to hearing from them. Look forward to hearing what they have to say and put that plan forward. Because I think that's some of the things that I felt that as a freshman that I've been missing is kind of been sitting up here and we're, we're, we've been floating along. And so I look forward to getting engaged and, and having some input and make sure that we do lay out for the American people exactly where we're going and when we're going to accomplish that and when we're going to get it done.
Are you hearing from your constituents about this? One of the things I found interesting, we have teams in the field asking voters about this, and in the early days of this crisis domestically here with no speaker, there were some people who were like, listen, I don't really even know who Kevin McCarthy is. How much is this penetrating for people in your district? No, you're exactly right. You know, the majority of the people, they want us to get our job done. They understand that there's high inflation, there's high interest rates, there's high unemployment. They know that we have $32 trillion in debt and county. And, and we only have, we've got a very short job description up here. Take your constituents and have oversight of the federal government. And, and that is to pass those appropriation bills. And we've got them teed up. We just need to go ahead and kick them out. Granted, it's late, but they're saying, why are you not at work? We need to be at work doing the business and getting the people's debt under control and getting this federal government operating in the right direction again. Part of that work is going to include figuring out the response to the international crisis unfolding overseas that we spent the first 30 yeah. minutes of our show talking about here. Of course, the war between Israel and Hamas after that terror attack on October 7th. The White House has now sent over this $100 billion money aid package, essentially. It includes money for both Israel and Ukraine. As it stands, is that something that you would support? No, I will not support it. We, we, I am wholeheartedly behind Israel, always will be. And if we want to support Israel separately, that's good. I'm not in for supporting Ukraine anymore. The European Union, they need to step up to the plate if they want to support Ukraine and do that. If, we've, if we want to look at, at funding and trying to, to get rid of an invasion, let's support and fund our border wall down there and get that invasion that we have on our southern border under control. But this no package does include border, border money, Congressman. No, it, yes, it does. But right now, this administration is spending border money on putting people in hotels, giving them food, giving them phones, and putting them up for a couple of years. And that's what's got to stop as well. You know, we need to spend okay. money on border for border okay. wall. Congressman Mike Collins, um, I know that you have no sense of timeline. What is your idea? Do you think maybe by next week this will be over? Just you know what? I, I would love to. I would love to say Monday that we'll have somebody. Hopefully by Wednesday, you know, midweek we will have a, a candidate and we'll be out there voting. Good Lord, when we need to, we need to get back to work for the American people. Congressman Mike Collins, thank you for being with us tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, former President Donald Trump's former campaign legal advisor is coming to a plea deal with prosecutors in that Georgia election interference case. Kenneth Chesbro pleaded guilty. He now faces five years of probation, a $5,000 fine, 100 hours of community service. It also means he may have to testify in any future trials, including possibly against the former president himself. Chesbro is the third former Trump attorney to cut a deal, to come to a plea deal with Fulton County prosecutors. Number two, speaking of the former president, a judge has fined him $5,000 and threatened him with jail time after Mr. Trump, he says, violated a partial gag order in his New York civil fraud trial. The judge, remember, had said that Mr. Trump had to take down a Truth Social post in which the former president went after the judge's law clerk. Even though the post was taken down online, a picture was still left up for a couple more weeks on a campaign website. The judge was not pleased. The former president's attorney apologized on his behalf, said it was basically a mistake, not done on purpose. Number three, the president of the United Auto Workers Union is threatening new walkouts at plants owned by those big three Detroit car companies. That's even as General Motors is joining Stellantis and Ford today, saying they, they will agree to boost money, paychecks for employees by 23%. The union president says that means that the automakers have money left to spend. It's been nearly six weeks since more than 30,000 union workers walked off the job. Number four, we now know why billions of snow crabs are disappearing from the ocean around Alaska. And it's because the water is getting warmer because of climate change. A new study says that warmer water probably led to the crabs starving to death. This news comes just a couple days after Alaska canceled its snow crab harvest season for the second year in a row because there just weren't enough crabs. Number five, astronomers detecting an intense flash of radio waves that took 8 billion years to get to Earth. It's one of the oldest bursts ever discovered. Really short, less than a millisecond long, but it released the same amount of energy that our sun puts out over three decades. So think about that. As much energy as the sun in less than the time it takes for you to say the word sun. Researchers say studying bursts like these can help measure how much matter actually exists in space. Heady stuff. Still ahead, our conversation with our former NBC News colleague whose family members are now free after being held hostage in Gaza.
Then we'll take you live to their hometown in Illinois, where people in the community are seeing some of their first glimmers of hope. Back to our top story tonight. An American mother and daughter now being released by Hamas after being kidnapped in Hamas's terror attack in Israel. They are being reunited with family now. And here we want to show you a picture that we are just getting into us in the last 25 minutes or so. We talked about it earlier in the show. Of President Biden, the White House says on the phone, the president says in the statement on the phone with those two Americans, Judith and Natalie Renan, you can see that smile on his face as he is speaking with them. The Renans are relatives of somebody we know well here at NBC News, former Tel Aviv bureau chief and correspondent Martin Fletcher. He's joining us now. Uh, and in fact, Martin, in the last 24 hours since you found out that these family members had been held hostages, held hostage to now and they've been released, Martin, I have to ask you, how are you doing? How is your family? What do you know? Well, I've got to say, Hallie, I'm doing fine. The family is celebrating. I think the, the, they, were, they were holding off on the celebrations before they knew what kind of condition um, Judith and Natalie were in, because they, the, it's, it's one thing to be released, but who knows what happened to them. Right. So by judging by the photographs that we can see, boy, they look tired and exhausted um, and no doubt traumatized, but they seem to be in good physical condition from what we can see from from these photographs, um, you know, this is a young woman <laughs> in her teens and, a, and, a, and a, a young mother. What have they been through? So as, as Josh said, the next thing is going to be debriefing by the Israeli mil military and intelligence sources. And um, well, you know, time to celebrate. But I can also tell you that today the same family or my family, my extended family, buried one person who was killed in the attack. And another member is still a hostage in Gaza, you know, so yeah. so um, it's something to celebrate and, and but not everything by a long way yet and yeah. many other you know we're celebrating most families are not you make an important point about um, the long road ahead for so many other families I want to have you put on your sort of um, Middle East analyst hat in just a second here but keep that you know Martin Fletcher husband hat on for me for just a second <laughs> longer because you know as you're as, you, as you've been through this process I know it's been deeply emotional deeply intense for your wife for her extended family here is there any further insight into the negotiations into getting them released, what they experienced while they were in Hamas captivity here. I imagine those are questions that the Israeli government, the Israeli intelligence services are going to want to know uh, and, and part of the process of them reacclimating after being under duress for so long. Yeah, you know, this question about being a hostage and then released, I mean, they're not the first person in his, people in history to go through this. It's going to be long, it's going to be traumatic, it's going to be dramatic, they're going to need a, a lot of uh, psychological support. But the first question is simply going to be, as I mentioned earlier, intelligence. And as Josh said, this is what this is critical. Where were they held? How many people were holding them? Were they in a group of three or four or 15 or 20? Was it like three or four Hamas fighters in a tunnel under the ground looking after just a, a handful. You know, Israel's task now is to, on the one hand, prosecute the ground war, on the other hand, try to reduce as, poss as much as possible the number of hostages who are going to be killed in that ground war. Because we know from the Hamas documents that Hamas's message to its own people was to kill the hostages who were being difficult and to use the others as human shields. So mm -hmm. the remaining hostages, that's the situation they're in. They will, they will be human shields. And Israel while prosecuting the ground war, number one priority will be to win the war. And what happens in getting there is going to be tough on everybody. How do you see the Israeli military, if at all, doing a recalibration here from, as you say, prosecuting the ground war while also holding in balance the possibility that now that the door has cracked open to the release of at least two hostages, your family members, there could be the release of more? Well, I, I think that Israel will probably be on, you know, mixed feelings, but it's an advantage for Israel in one sense in that, in that the reason we haven't seen a ground invasion so far is probably because Israel and the United States and other allies are still gaining intelligence trying to find out where are the hostages, what condition are they in. So that's, that's and also other elements that they need to recheck. When you talk about recalibration, don't forget one thing, Israel totally, utterly miscalculated and got it wrong about the invasion. So they must be looking at their uh, intelligence that they've got so far and reassessing what they already know. So there is a lot of intelligence work to be done before the troops actually go in. 
Can I just ask you, Martin, and I know you have so much on your plate at this moment here, but can you just take a step back for a second? And I know that you are just one family out of so many who is who has gone through, frankly, um, a, a living hell over the past couple of weeks, not knowing what has happened to your relatives, not knowing what's happening with the people you love. It's been about three hours since you've learned of this news um, to reflect on where you are. Well, me personally, I mean, I can't separate my own family from the other families. I know it yeah. sounds like I'm trying to be noble, but I'm not. It's just a fact. Great. My family is celebrating. As I said before, my family has another hostage inside Gaza anyway. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, if those groups, if the hostages are being held in groups of three or four or five, which I imagine to be the case, that's like 50 different places where hostages are being held throughout Gaza. Mm -hmm. How do you find them? They couldn't find one. One Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, when he was held by Hamas for five years in Gaza. They couldn't find one guy in five years. I'm not sure how they're going to find 200 in five days. Martin Fletcher, uh, we're so glad uh, to have you with us tonight, uh, especially tonight. And uh, a lot of people around the country and around the world are thinking of you and all those other families affected by this war. Thank you. <laughs> Relief also being felt just outside Chicago, where this mother and daughter live. Maggie Vespa is joining us now from the suburb of Evanston. Maggie, um, really a meaningful moment for so many in Evanston. I know you had a chance to speak with Natalie and Judith's rabbi, right? Tell us more. Yeah, exactly. That's why we're standing here. We just spoke to him in the last hour or so. I've also talked to a friend of Judith's over the phone. Everybody here just saying for the first time in weeks, they are going to get a good night's sleep tonight. Mm. The relief is just rippling through this community. They've spent weeks in agony, just like the families that, you know, really uh, have remained really tight lipped throughout this entire thing. We've spoken mainly to the rabbi throughout all of this and kind of to friends uh, who know these two. They learned with the rest of the world that Judith and Natalie were being released that uh, by Hamas today. Day, and they're waiting, just like everybody else, on pins and needles for updates on their condition uh, and basically a timeline for when they'll be able to reunite uh, with these two who are so important to the community here. And the rabbi says uh, they've, been, they've been a part of his congregation for so long. It's just something that everybody here is processing in real time with the rest of the world. Take a listen to part of what the rabbi had to say just a few minutes ago. As much as we are so grateful that Judith and Natalie have been released, we are also certain that we are talking about evil people, an evil group that needs to be eradicated and that needs to be removed from Gaza. Yeah, the rabbi quick to refocus there um, again on so many that are still being held hostage. You know, at the same time, also something that we asked about was the timeline. Obviously, you know, Hallie, um, NBC's Martin Fletcher, who you spoke to earlier, went on TV last night on 11th hour on MS and said that uh, Natalie and Judith are relatives of his, relatives of his wife. And suddenly, less than 24 hours later, they're released. I asked the rabbi if he thinks that that timeline is a coincidence, that suddenly these higher profile hostages were released. He simply said, I think that our prayers have been answered. Mm. Hallie. Maggie Vespa, we're so glad to have you there with so many in the community waiting to welcome back Judith and Natalie with open arms. Maggie, thank you so much for being there. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of the UK, at least three people are dead blamed on the rain and wind slamming northern Europe. You can see people knee-deep in water, cars swimming in it, really. Forecasters say some spots could get almost a foot of rain. Out of Switzerland, the International Olympics Committee says it is not biased against Russian athletes. That's after Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, accused that group of, I'm quoting here, ethnic discrimination. The IOC has suspended the Russian Olympic Committee over the war in Ukraine. Russian athletes may still be allowed to compete in the next Olympics under a neutral status. And out of Italy, the the Prime Minister there says she is separating from her partner, a TV journalist, in a story that has really rocked people in Italy. They were together about a decade. He's come under criticism for sexist comments. Maloney, the Prime Minister Maloney, says their paths have diverged. Still to come, the U.S. sandwiched between two hurricanes. The new details were just getting in. But first, the manhunt for a suspect who police say killed a Maryland judge in his driveway. That's next. <laughs> 
Right now, police are looking for a suspect who they say shot and killed a Maryland judge in his own driveway in a targeted attack after the judge ruled against him in a divorce case. Look at this. Police are just releasing these pictures of the alleged shooter and the car that they think he's driving. Warning, he may be armed and dangerous. Listen. This was a targeted attack on Judge Wilkinson. Uh, we've identified Pedro Argote, 49, of Frederick, Maryland, as a suspect in this case. Argote is not in custody and is considered armed and dangerous. We're a small community here, close knit, knit so we, uh, we pull together when something like this happens. You're seeing Judge Andrew Wilkinson here. He presided over a hearing in the suspect's divorce case, giving his wife custody of their kids just hours before the judge was allegedly shot and killed. Officials say the judge's wife and son were inside the house. They were home when this happened. I want to bring in Tom Costello, who's following this one for us. So, Tom, what else do we know about the search for the suspect? It is very much a, a, a manhunt that involves yeah. local authorities, state troopers, as well as uh, the U.S. Marshals. This is a very high-profile case. Uh, this gentleman is thought to have killed a judge, uh, a 52-year-old judge. Mm. He himself has children and a wife at home. That's the suspect right there, as we mentioned, Pedro Argote. Listen, he had just lost custody of his four children that day. The judge had given custody to his ex-wife, and there was a history of domestic violence there. So for whatever reason, he then allegedly showed up at the judge's house and murdered him in his driveway, the judge's wife and son, inside the house at the time. This is a high priority. The, may the governor of Maryland just tweeting out that he is re absolutely repulsed by this, mm -hmm. and it is a high priority for the state, and that becomes obviously a big deal for federal authorities, too. This is the kind of case that sends chills down the spines of others who are part of the judicial branch in moments like this, right? Because this is the absolutely. nightmare scenario for somebody um, like a judge in this instance making a ruling like yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. We went and looked, by the way, at the numbers of cases or threats, I should say, against federal judges. He was not a federal right. judge, but federal judges. 4,500 threats in 2021. That was the high watermark. That was post the election, of course. And then it came down to about 1,300 or so last year. So these numbers have trended down. And, but we have had occasional homicides involving judges. Nonetheless, you heard the sheriff talking about the need to find this suspect. Last night, initially, in the preliminary investigation, we, we had no idea that the information was coming in. So we placed uh, officers and troopers at the local judges here in the county at their residence just as a precaution initially, and they stayed there through the night till this morning. But we, we don't feel that there's any threat currently to other judges in the county or the state. Yeah, to reiterate, the suspect is still armed and dangerous, and they don't know where he is right now. Tom Costello, uh, again, just a chilling case. Thank you for bringing us up to speed on all those developments. You bet. Appreciate it. Tonight, the East Coast is getting soaked again right at the start of the weekend with rain expected to hit the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, New England, as we are seeing hurricanes in both the Atlantic and the Pacific brewing off both coasts. You've got Norma. Now a Category 3, winds up to 120 miles an hour, aiming at Mexico, at Cabo. Um, and in the Atlantic, Hurricane Tammy is aiming at the Caribbean. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens is joining us now. Where's the biggest threat tonight, Bill? Break it down. Uh, as far as uh, life and property, I'd have to say the Cabo area. That's probably going to be the worst of it. That'll be during the day tomorrow. Uh, as far as the Northeast goes, I'd love to stay positive. I'm trying to put a spin on this because it has been miserable weekend after weekend. There's rain tonight from Ohio all the way to Maine. Showers and storms rolling through the Carolinas. But there's no airport delays. So it's not like one of those storms that's causing like you know horrific travel issues. We're not seeing flash flooding. We're not getting property damage or stuff like that. It's just annoying that it's raining again. And this will be a Eight, eight of the nine, eight of the last ten have been in Philadelphia and New York wet. D.C. about half of your weekends this fall, and in Boston, same for you. And this one will obviously be a wet weekend. And the biggest problem financially is all the fall festivities, the apple picking, all of the fall foliage, huge tourist industry throughout northern New England. The leaves are at their peak, and they're just losing just a ton of money weekend after weekend. People are canceling because they don't want to be out there in conditions like this. So on 11 a.m. Saturday, the green shows you where the light rain is. The 
yellow and the red's a heavy rain. Notice New York City southwards by 11 a.m., you're done. So it's not a complete washout your entire weekend from Philly to D.C. to southwards. It's really from Hartford to Boston, northern New England. It's an ugly Saturday, and it stays that way right into Sunday. And eventually some of that rain may come back down on you, Boston, as we go through the evening. I know the Patriots have a big football game there during the day, so we'll see how that plays out. And as far as the hurricanes go, Tammy, it looks like it's going to be a glancing blow. A Category 1 in the islands, a lot of infrastructure is kind of built for this. It does actually get stronger after that, but it avoids Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. We're talking about Barbuda and Antigua. Those are the islands that are most at risk of seeing some damage. And as far as our major Category 3 Hurricane Norma goes, this one looks big and impressive. Here's Cabo. It's heading directly north. It'll weaken as it gets there. We're hoping it weakens a lot, but the water is warmer than it should be this time of year. And right now, it looks like they're going to deal with a Category 2 hurricane tomorrow. They've only been hit by a major hurricane four times in recorded history, so this is a big deal. Bill Karens, thank you very much for that update. Coming up here on the show, as we talk about the war right now happening between Israel and Hamas, it is the furthest thing from peace in the region. But that hasn't always been the case. We're taking a look in just a sec. The British Prime Minister meeting with the Egyptian president today, where the Egyptian leader says he hopes talks could potentially pick back up, even in the middle of this war that could end up leading to peace in the region and perhaps the creation of a Palestinian state. That is a goal that seems very, very far off today, perhaps. But just about three decades ago, the various sides were not quite as far apart as you might imagine. Our NBC's Raf Sanchez has more. As Israel and Hamas descend further into war, the prospects for a broader Israeli-Palestinian peace deal seem further away than ever. But 30 years ago, that peace appearing on the cusp after decades of conflict. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. Neighboring Arab states launching a war against Israel after it was founded. The international community envisioning a Palestinian state, too. But Israel fighting with Arab countries in conflicts like the Six-Day War and Yom Kippur War, alongside clashes with Palestinians, preventing that state from fully emerging. One of Israel's fiercest soldiers in those years, Itzhak Rabin, growing into a warrior of peace after being re-elected prime minister in 1992. Rabin spent many years in the Israeli Defense Forces. He knew the cost of war better than most. Rabin opening a door to negotiations with Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat's Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO. At that time, the PLO designated a terrorist group by the United States and a tumultuous Palestinian uprising called the First Intifada in full swing. After months of preliminary talks, Rabin reluctantly met Arafat in Washington. Bill Clinton had to coach him along and say, I know this isn't easy. I know this has been your enemy for a long, long time. But here's our opportunity, uh, and we should grab it. The two, once bitter adversaries, shaking hands, and their delegations signing the Oslo Accord. Enough of blood and tears. Enough! The difficult decision we reached together was one that required great and exceptional courage. The PLO would recognize Israel's right to exist, and Israel would begin transitioning control of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank to Palestinians. The deal, just the beginning for Rabin. Israel signed a peace treaty with Jordan in 1994, and another Oslo Accord with Arafat in 1995. What could be the most promising step yet toward peace in the Arab lands that Israel has occupied since the 1967 war. That November, Rabin speaking at a giant rally for peace in Tel Aviv. But just as he left the stage, tragedy. Four or five shots rang out and Rabin collapsed into the arms of his security men. Rabin killed not by a Palestinian, but by a 24-year-old Israeli extremist who opposed the peace process. A blood-stained paper found in his jacket pocket. On it, lyrics of Shir La Shalom, or a song for peace. <laughs> he sang on stage just moments before his death. In the days following, a national moment of silence. At two o'clock this afternoon, the city of Jerusalem ground to a halt. Rabin's death shocking the world. The world has lost one of its greatest men. 
a warrior for his nation's freedom, and now a martyr for his nation's peace. Very shocked for this awful and terrible crime. The fallout of that traumatic loss inflaming hardliners on both sides of the conflict. Rubin's assassination was a tremendous blow to the peace process. Israel soon drifting rightward in the vacuum of a strong leader pushing for peace. You had Israelis who were in profound doubts about the wisdom of negotiating with the PLO. And Bibi Netanyahu was at the forefront of those with those doubts. Netanyahu coming to power for the first time in 1996. Violence soon flared back up. Bus bombings as part of two more intifadas that killed thousands. Israeli settlement construction ramping up. More peace proposals falling flat, a blockade of Gaza, and now another war. But when this war someday ends, perhaps a new generation of leaders will look back at this moment, recognize how close peace felt, and be inspired by some of Rabin's last words. In every central square of every city, scream out and cheer, only for peace. Our thanks to Raf Sanchez for that reporting. That does it for us for this hour, but we've got a lot more coverage coming up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.